single owner. We were the first in fright since 1979, and we believe everyone screams in the same language. This is a little bit of horror meets inside the actor's studio style, giving a closer look at these creators, the movie magic, and the guts it takes. We were neither here nor there. We were in the moment, enjoying our shared passion of horror. So let's forget about the outside world for the next hour while we enjoy each other's company. Today we are presenting Black Veil. Just want to give everyone a little heads up. We are not doing a traditional Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation panel, just pop them into the question box in your Zoom. I'll try my best to bring them up naturally in conversation. So I just wanted to get started. We'll go ahead and jump in. Dan, how do you all know each other? Um, and if you guys want to introduce yourself and your past work. Uh, well, Jeffrey and I go back a ways. We, we met at, uh, at the Mile High Film Festival. Um, it's been several years now, quite a few years. And um, so we had always hung out together during the horror film festival there and got to know each other and always sort of, you know, appreciate each other's talents. And, and, uh, and he's just a good guy and always wanted to work together on stuff. So Early on, when we started kind of developing these ideas for shooting in Florida and the South, him being from Kentucky himself and, and uh, originally born in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, we, we thought it was cool to do a sort of horror anthology idea that sort of played into some of those themes that we, that we grew up with. And so as time moved on and we developed some of these ideas, um, Christian... Uh, Krempel, who's a friend of mine and also a producer on the project, um, along with, with Doug Fox, introduced us to Danny McBride and Alex Popoff and, and uh, Tommy McLaughlin as well. And those guys, you know, being big fans of, of their work, um, uh, came on board as is, is, uh, being part of this sort of anthology we're putting together. And I mean, I just couldn't ask for a better group of people. They were, they're, they've really been super supportive and and our whole thing is about having fun and doing something that we all love and, and, and uh, really scaring people, but having a good time doing it. So I've got, we've got a really great group of super talented filmmakers here that's gonna help make that happen. So, uh, so yeah, we all sort of got to know each other after this last several months and we're very, very excited about making this happen. Yeah, so you touched a bit about that, about the anthology nature of it. This is an exploration into the myths and legends of the American South. I'm from Georgia, so I love these mythos, love them. Uh, how, uh, I guess, how does your background play into that? Can you expand upon what it is about the South that lends itself to the genre and why so many great horror stories spring from the South? Jeffrey, you wanna take that one? Well, I mean, I think from my personal experience, I, I think, especially where I grew up there, there just wasn't a lot to do. <laughs> um, you know, we would, you know, we would had our farm and we'd, you know, me and my friends would go out and run around in the woods at night and stuff like that. So I think those kind of campfire tales um, kind of evolved from, you know, you had to use your imagination for entertainment. Um, and so the interesting thing is, as I got older, I started realizing that a lot of these stories, like the woman in white and other kind of myths like that, were, there were versions of that in every state. You know, they all had their same kind of core mythology that was the same with it's just a different spin on it and then when you step back further you realize that these are kind of all over the world so i think that whole, that whole having to kind of entertain yourself and the best thing to you know i think exercising uh or, yeah that's right exercising fear from yourself is something that you can do when you tell these stories and scare each other because you're in a safe environment you're with friends even though you're out in the middle of nowhere in the dark woods um so i think that that's probably why these stories have kind of been universal um is because we've had to entertain ourselves um, before we got all the, like the internet to entertain us. And now we don't have to think at all. We just sit back and let the computer think for us. Yeah, these stories from the gamut, from personal to being political, touching on history, parenting. Can you each discuss your individual episode and what drew you guys to this particular story? Should I start guys? Go ahead. Uh, well, I, we've shot the pilot episode. It was written by a friend of mine out of LA uh, named Chris Peckinpah, and I directed it. And um, it's called Camera Obscure. And briefly, it's about this sort of haunted camera, this camera that's possessed 
um, that sort of passed around um, from one person to the next. And our main character, um, it sort of happens upon this, car this, this camera through this other third party, through a photo she sees at a gallery and decides to look this guy up. And she becomes sort of, I would say, haunted or possessed um, by childhood trauma that she went through and this camera sort of drives her to solve and find out and to kind of resolve those traumatic issues in her life and it I don't want to give the end away but it sort of culminates in her revisiting her childhood in a way um, and taking care of business so um, so that's basically the first episode which has been shot We've, we're editing it now and um, and then um, I'll let the other guys take it away I don't know who did two who's, who did who's, two? who's episode two I just go in order. Well, actually, Chris Pickleball is going to do episode two. It's called, it's called Wisteria. He's not here, so um, he's directing episode two. It's called Wisteria, um, and it's it's a you know um, a, a pretty creepy story um, that takes place around a morgue, and a guy that works at a morgue is absolutely convinced that a child that came in on 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 one of the slabs is actually still alive, and um, and kidnaps it and decides to kind of bring it back to life and that ends up as you would imagine kind of badly so that's that's two <laughs> that's uh, the game it's your turn <laughs> alex and i did three and you know when with dan the other guys when we we first met them turned out that a lot of us had spent time in the south and you know seeing antebellum and victoria style victorian style architecture and then seeing giant oak trees with spanish moss dripping off of them and Swampland and all that kind of stuff. When you go camping at night, it is a little creepy. So I guess if I was 14 and had Jeffrey across, we would have been trying to see who was going to freak the other person out the most. And <laughs> so Alex and I are doing a story that takes place at a, an old uh, nursing home during COVID. So there's a little bit of the paranoia and nervousness and confusion that's going on. But this ties directly into a little piece of Twisted History, which is about Ponce de Leon looking for the Fountain of Youth. So mm -hmm. the mysterious owner of the facility is an, an old lady, and there are strings of deaths every so often, and which could or could not be have something to do with the fact that she needs uh, vital human resources in order to regenerate. Mm -hmm. And it's about a young African-American woman that is working there and starts to suspect that there is something creepy going on. She's a, she's a self-made detective in yes, our story, sort of. It turns out that she has a lot in common with the owner and that they both have really dark secrets. Yeah, and if you guys, I mean, if you guys, uh, I don't know if everybody knows or not, but uh, Danny is a creator of Underworld franchises. So this vampire lore with immortality and constant look for food and hunger is not a stranger to his genre. So we're definitely capitalizing on that. And I think it's the story is creepy, entertaining, and it, and it is ties to everything uh, that's already created in, in that particular series and hopefully gives extension to ours, to the story, you know, to overall arc of the story. All, all the, the episodes series. are connected. Dan made sure yeah. the connected tissue running through with almost like what Jeffrey was talking about. Even when I lived on Guam as a kid, we had a lady in white on Guam. She had a Chamorro name, but it was the lady in white. And uh, so we have the lady that wears the black veil. And uh, so she is a running theme and we may or may not in the first season get to learn a little bit about her along the way and hopefully f further in the future, learn more. Mystery. Sure. Am I, am I up? You're up, Tom. You're okay. up, Tommy. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm Hollywood <laughs> born and bred, not the one in Florida, obviously the one on the West Coast. But out of the over 40 films I've done, almost half of them have been shot in the South. So I came in and kind of as the guy to, you know, just going to be there temporary to make a movie, but absolutely fell in love with the people and the culture. And it's been just for me, I, I hell of a you know, discovery process. Every movie, every town, there's something else. And I always go on the ghost hunts, you know, the, the ghost tours, all that kind of stuff, because that's just, you know, so much a part of me. And the only time I've actually had 
what one would call an encounter has occurred, you know, in New Orleans. And uh, it was something that I had no logical explanation for. And part of me was just thrilled to actually have something that I couldn't, you know, <laughs> I couldn't logically talk about in, in, to anybody that they were going, oh, come on. It's like, it happened. But my story actually uh, deals with sort of the classic thing of, you know, the person on the dark road, you know, they need to spend the night someplace and they end up, you know, going to one of these classic, you know, plantation houses that are you know, surrounded by, uh, you know, the great oaks and then like his, uh, Danny was saying, the, uh, the moss and all that. And this particular girl or woman, um, she is coming down from New York to do a, uh, a presentation in Florida and she kind of gets off the beaten track and gets down here. She's very liberal or so she says, but she's very deep seated in racism from her father, from her grandfather, but in total denial of that. And this place that she ends up is a kind of a purgatory where literally she's given kind of a choice to hold on to what she has in her subconscious for so many years, you know, or let it go. And it becomes a kind of very intense uh, ghost story, but the, uh, the ghost is pretty solid <laughs> in terms of the, its form. And you would think what she goes through, she would change her, you know, her tune, but of course she doesn't. And uh, the name of it is The Hanging Tree. And um... All right, all right. <laughs> So yeah, we're 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 pretty pumped about um, you know these 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 stories that we're doing and in the go the overarching goal I think Danny touched into it about there being this sort of connective tissue not only with the with the woman and and black the black veiled woman but also this sort of southern gothic you know motif I mean we all feel that's a huge character in each one of our our films and so playing in that world um, and you know that that sort of rural backdrop that that is full of woods and spooky stories and folklore um you know we've all had experience in and and i just think you know this group of, of filmmakers giving them sort of creative freedom to you know do these cool projects that we can all tie together kind of makes this series sort of special and it's it's got its own sort of fingerprint on the southern gothic um, theme. So we're very excited about it. Should be should be very cool. Yeah, and I'll, always for stories from the South. Just yeah. A little, little bit partial. Um, it's I'd just so many, you know. <laughs> it, yeah, we have, we have a lot, which I love. Um, we're curious to hear about your relationship with your crews and the collaborated, uh, collaborative nature of filmmaking. Um, we always hear about, you know, the, the kind of, you know, masters of horror, things like that. But we know that a lot of the creative department heads are such a pivotal kind of, you know, sidekick and partner and collaborator in these process, processes. Um, do you guys have main crew department heads that you guys work with even on your past projects? Or, you know, who's sort of the Robin to your Batman, or are they sort of, you know, the Batman to your Robin, or who, who are those people that you guys work with all the time that you really latch on to? Well, speaking for myself, the, the last project we did in Florida, which, uh, you know, Doug Fox, who was our producer, sort of our day-to-day -day producer on it, um, you know, really helped set up a lot of our crew heads. We had a, a got a, deep, a DP, Nicholas Matthews out of LA, who was our, kind of my cinematographer but for the most part all the crew was all local hires and they did a fantastic job for us and we're and we really want to try to hire locally whenever possible because we you know we think there's a lot of great talent in Florida a lot of have, are working in Atlanta and sort of like commuting up to Atlanta but um, but for myself you know having a good crew with a good attitude and everybody's sort of you know moving in the same direction and and, and rooting for the film to win is really important for me and where we try to kind of, in, you know, at least myself, try to kind of develop an environment of, of, you know, positivity on set and it's hard enough. I mean, it's making a movie, but, um, but just general respect for everybody and appreciation for all the collaborative efforts that everyone is involved. I mean, whether you're a grip or, you know, uh, an art director, or whatever, someone has something to contribute artistically to the movie that you wouldn't have done on your own. So that's always been my experience. I can't I could speak for everybody else, but that's been, that's been me. 
How are you guys working together? Can you explain a little bit more about the relationship because it is an anthology? Are there things that sort of flow throughout the whole process? Are you guys, you know, checking in with each other about, you know, kind of like cross, I don't know if it's called, you know, cross episode, but are there things that come up um, in multiple episodes or how are you guys overall directing a project that's sort of, you know, episode based? Uh, well, not that to dominate the whole conversation, but I'll let you go, go everyone will talk about the particular project, but, but my, my, my <coughs> mandate for is that we just sort of like keep it within this sort of Southern Gothic realm. Um, but I really wanted to invite everyone's own idea, like, well, give me a, give us projects that you really have always been wanting to do, because I, I feel that I get the best work out of myself. And I know, you know, if you're really digging something that's been sitting on your hard drive for a while that you want to make, and if it plugs into this realm, then let's do it. So, um, so yeah, it just as long as it sort of sticks into that motif and we kind of lace in this sort of black veil woman in some weird way, um, I'm, I'm pretty open um, to, to whatever anybody wants to bring to the table. And, I, I, you know, all of us here have been through years of, of rewriting and that is writing is rewriting and studio notes so with this group it's been very um, rewarding from a creative point of view because we can just toss ideas out and somebody say that's crap and then somebody say oh no that's cool and and it's much quicker than dealing with a bunch of people in suits yeah. in order room and people that are fearing for their jobs because uh, we're doing this uh, you know low budget and on our own so we don't have the big masters over us so we think that we're all experienced enough that uh we can develop the material ourselves and it's funner that way too and and it's it's nice because we each have our own little quirks and we're all a little different and uh you know i mean Blair Witch was obviously groundbreaking and Jeffrey and I were more in the popcorn kind of, uh, you know, horror movie slash action movie kind of thing. But uh, for we all came from low budget and we all came from horror. I mean, I used to go buy Fangoria magazine at 7-Eleven when I was a kid. And, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's now, you know, it's a website, but, you know, I think that we've all been around a block a few times for Alex because he's just out of diapers. But uh, yeah, that's right. You know, I'm the Robin. I'm the Robin yeah. in this group. It's <laughs> not going to wear a cod piece. I mean, we're not going to do that. Kind of <laughs> no um, but anyway, I mean, it's been great because we email back and forth and then we joke and then we talk about the fact that we're going to form a garage band and, uh, you know, we're going to really jam some serious tunes probably from the seventies and eighties and we'll wear wigs <laughs> and we probably paint our faces too. Yeah. And uh, no, we've had great conversations and you know, me, Tom rubs it in my face that he's met Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. But you know, it's cool. I mean, it, we've had a great time. It's been uh, very liberating, especially in this weird, uh, you know, unending pandemic nightmare that is, you know, taking the winds out of our sails because everything in Hollywood's upside down. It's yeah. shut down. Do you guys think that this has sort of been a blessing to your particular project because you guys have had more time to talk to each other? And then what are you guys doing? Are you guys Zooming regularly? I know you guys can't really like go grab beers or, or jam together, but you know, has this been sort of a bit of creative freedom on top of that, you know, freedom with being disconnected from the studio? I think I think it's definitely definitely uh, strange times we're living right now, and the Hollywood is shut down. Everything's on pause, and I think it uh, it kind of a it's a step that helps uh, creative individuals to involve like evolve, move forward. You know, discover a new relationships, discover new ways to push in their projects forward. Uh, I think that's what what happens. It's uh, you know, and and as Danny said, uh, even though I'm still the youngest in the group, I'm still working on my, uh, you know, uh, badge of honor, sort of speak in the in the horror community. But uh, the key is you know finding the uh, individuals that think alike, that have similar passions, that have similar 
sort of moral stance and and also love for for genre for storytelling and that's what pushed us forward to create you know create this this collaboration uh you know we talented all we're all talented enough to create the content i think technically uh we're all experienced enough to put our skills to the table you know as a filmmakers and because we're all you know came came from uh, uh you know no budget kind of a uh, genres you know to start with we all know our own shortcuts and way arounds you know how to make a quality product and tell the quality story and then that's uh i think you know you don't really the studio doesn't dictate if you have talent or not if you have passion or not that's something you got to have in your heart if you have it in your heart then it's i mean shit the sky is the limit you know so i think that's uh that's kind of my two cents on that but to be honest i'm i'm super super happy and honored to be like you know among among this group of uh, legendary filmmakers so uh you know i'll bring to the table whatever i can Yeah, I mean, my own background, I was a, you know, a former production coordinator, PA worked my way up, started independently producing and then, you know, this year got a crazy wacky idea to buy Fangoria with <laughs> with my business partner. So, you know, Abby and I grew up on this just like you you guys did and it's such a passion and kind of, you know, joy that we have each day to be able to interact with everyone and like kind of, you know, live in our Fangoria universe. So selfish question on our end. Um, you know, everyone has this love and passion for these types of films. Uh, you know, were you inspired by Fangoria growing up? And like, what was the moment that you guys knew? You know, for me, there was always, you know, these moments I saw in movies that really like triggered that for me and was like, I want to go into genre filmmaking rather than, you know, like making a love story or a comedy. What was that moment for you guys? Like, you know obviously growing up with Fangoria did that inspire you and then also what made you you know specifically want to do genre filmmaking um on my family i actually got hooked in the 50s um with famous monsters magazine and that was the beginning kind of the beginning of oh my god here's here, here's a magazine that actually is showing stuff that i love you know that especially all the universal you know horror monsters and as you know time went on and began to be a filmmaker and Fangoria started then it was like this is great because it's not just the old classics what's going on right now and one of the highlights of my life was having Jason lives uh with uh, Jason and Alice Cooper on the cover of Fangoria and I'm still I mean I just last week you know up my subscription to be back there again cuz the the new magazine is just so cool and so well put together and uh, so it's, it's always been an inspiration and continues to be Yeah, I mean I I love Fangory. I mean again growing up where I I did, you know, we had to subscribe to it. I mean my friends would always get Fangory magazine and you know th the thing about it is, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street is a movie that cemented my love for the genre and you know, I got to read in Fangory how they did all the si the special effects. So most people were like, how can you guys watch this stuff? You're sick and we're like, no, we're cool. Um but you know, we really started studying it because Fangory lets you see what was going on behind the scenes. So it kind of demystified the fear for you so you got to see how they did all the stuff so we were like the cool makeup and the you know special effects uh so definitely fangoria was a a huge part of i think most of our growing up and it was like you know i want to get on the cover of fangoria i don't think i've done it yet so um i know the new owner so hopefully uh, she can work something out but you know <laughs> nice way to work it shameless <laughs> shameless plug here we go here we go no you know it's funny uh, i'm i'm actually with jeffrey on that one one of my one of my uh, favorite films from when i was growing up and by the way i don't know if you could tell or not i have a russian accent so i grew up in russia um i moved to the united states in 1999 so we didn't have fangoria in 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 the in soviet union We then but we did uh we did film uh, we did have films pirated uh from probably through China and Japan to uh behind the uh, iron curtain and nightmare on elm street that was one of my favorites uh loved all the effects and gore the thing had a lot of practical effects and uh friday the 13th had a lot of you know blood gore effects and and again just as jeffrey i was so fascinated how it was done and i think that's what uh, pushed my love for the for the genre and for filmmaking especially and then when i got to the united states um i think it was uh in in anchorage alaska in barnes and nobles i have 
uh, found first uh, first time I've, I've encountered the Fangoria magazine, and I was hooked. I mean, all the behind the scenes, everything was just 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 awesome. So that's uh, that's 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 my that's my kind of a story about uh, about the magazine and uh, and the filmmaking in general. <laughs> Want to go? Okay. Well, I, I mentioned that I used to get it at Seven Eleven. I uh, I love Star Wars, and that got me interested in film. But it seemed like something that was, you know, out of, you know, like unattainable. And then I saw Alien by Ridley Scott, and I started looking at some behind the scenes things, and there wasn't a lot around to look at. So there were just a few publications and there was no internet. So you, you had to find some of these things. And then I went and snuck in to see Friday the 13th and went camping with my friend Dwayne DeBois in Jacksonville, Florida at night after seeing I slept with a machete in my sleeping bag. And some hunters went down the, the, through the woods that night. But I love looking at the behind the scenes footage, seeing the interviews and, uh, there was so little content for people that were interested in this. And then you're talking about the thing and nightmare and Elm Street. I'm sure all of us were impacted by all of these movies. Some of them have aged well, some of them have not, some of them are laugh riot now, but other ones, the story's great, even though the effects may not be great, but some of that stuff, that practical stuff still looks better than CGI in many respects, if it's done right. So, you know, I mean, it's always the cutting edge of, of seeing these, these movies that we loved that were ignored. They were, you know, the press hated them, the critics hated them. Why, you know, even in Hollywood, a lot of people look at making horror movies as slumming it. They'll make a horror movie to make some money, but they're sort of embarrassed by it unless it becomes, you know, something that is making money and, you know, sequels and all of that. But uh, for the most part, you know, when I started out, I, I didn't expect my first thing to be about werewolves to get uh, sold and made. And uh, on the film side, I had been producing television, but I, uh, I quickly found out that at my agency, I was now the werewolf in space guy. That's what, the, that's what these people thought of me because I found out that, that <laughs> not everybody's into this kind of stuff in Hollywood. They, they want to make highbrow stuff they want to win awards so they don't you know when you go in and you pitch something if you were to pitch something like prometheus to them they would look at you and be waiting for you to be escorted out you know <laughs> but i want to hear dan's answer because he went out and did something about it right away uh well i you know fangoria was sort of part of our cultural dna growing up it was just you know and like the guy said, you know, it was one of the few resources that you could go behind the scenes and see how they did the makeup and how they made the, made the effects. And that I really love that part of filmmaking. I, I definitely am like a frustrated engineer in a lot of ways because I just love how it all comes together. And um, and you have to, you know, I have to remind I have a 15 year old son and a 11 year old girl, and I have to explain to them like these modern movies, like there were no digital effects in those days. Everything had to be done on the day and built or miniatures or whatever. And it had to, you, and the, you know, and the challenge of, of making that work was, is you, you had, you didn't get to tweak it for two months in, in post, right? So, um, so I really love that about, about Fangoria. And, and for me, it's, you know, a lot of people ask me about horror films I grew up with, and there's certainly some that, that had an effect on me, like It's Alive and Legend of Boggy Creek who had a big influence on me. But, um, but yeah, like The Shining or, you know, more recently, Jacob's Ladder, The Exorcist, The Omen series. I mean, when you really break those down, I never thought of those as horror films. They were, they were just amazing movies. You know, incredibly written characters, great stories, and and just superb execution that just happened to scare the pee out of you. But um, but you know, that to me is what I think horror doesn't get a lot of its its credit. You know, and I like I'm happy to see more recently that we're seeing really nice, well executed. Um, I, sh I mean, they have been for a while, but getting the respect they deserve. We're seeing horror films really play on a broader, larger scale where 
A-list actors are starting to sign up for these things because they're well written and well executed and they should be competing in the Oscars. Um, I think uh, Parasite won last year, right? So, um, so the, it is, it is um, a genre that I've always been in love with. Fangoria has always been a part of it growing up. And, and, um, and yeah, I hope to be, I hope to do it justice for as long as I'm able to make movies. Yeah, on that note, I just want to jump in and just ask you guys, I know, you know, so much with the focus on Fangoria has always been, it's, you know, 40 year history. Um, and something that I'm really passionate about and I'll be passionate about since we bought it is really focusing on, you know, the below the line talent and also just like the next generation, regardless of, you know, how old anyone is, it doesn't necessarily mean young people, but just people that are, you know, coming into the space for the first time, um, because there are filmmakers now that realize that they grew up on these movies that we, we all loved and grew up with, but maybe they got sidelined, you know, in comedy or got, you know, got put over here. Like you guys said, you get kind of put in a corner. I do think, you know, the genre space is so much fun and the, just the community around it is always just, you know, we go and we yell and we rally and we, you know, go to the midnight screenings and, these types of things. What are the films you guys have seen lately? Um, you know, the up and coming, the, you know, the first time directors, the, the people that are on your radar. Can you guys talk a little bit more about what you guys are seeing in the current moment um, and how you guys are excited about that kind of breath of fresh air? Tara, right, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to bounce because I have a class that I have to teach of uh, three hours of young filmmakers. So <laughs> thank you so much. Generation. You <laughs> Good to see you guys. Uh, thank you very right. much, Tom. Bye-bye. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye. Jeffrey, go. Oh, God, I knew you were going to do that. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll show you. I, I can't tell you the director's name. I'm, am, am I embarrassed? No, I'm terrible with names. It took me a month to get all these guys' names. I had their names written down, and I looked at their IMDb pages had them all for that. That's a lie. But anyway, I watched this movie, The Lighthouse, which was black and white about these two guys in a White House, and it was it was fabulous. Now I don't know if it's technically a horror movie, but I think a lot of genre bending has been going on. And I think that's what's exciting about the horror genre now. You could look at Birdcage or you could look at uh any of the new ones, uh, 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 uh get out. You know, a little bit of twist on things, very simple, sort of Hitchcockian, big twist, simple twist, going to Sixth Sense. You, you know, I think that there's a lot of stuff that's been coming on Netflix that's well done. I also think there's been a lot of stuff that's not well done. And, uh, you know, it's all a matter of taste. But I just want to touch on one thing. You're talking about people below the line people and people that work on the sets. Um, you know, when we were doing Underworld, we brought in Patrick Totopoulos to make all these fantastic creatures for us, the, the werewolves and, and the, the vampire effects and everything. His shop was amazing. And I was like a little boy geeking out at all the stuff in his shop. And he's an amazing talent. And during that process, I ended up having to spend an hour or two with Phil Tippett, who I knew who, I knew who Phil Tippett was when I was a little boy because I was a Star Wars fan. And he was one of the guys that did the monsters for Star Wars. And he was the puppet guy. And so I'm talking to him. And we, this is before we had hired Patrick. And I said, do you still do any practical effects? And he said, no, no, nobody, nobody really does anymore. And all those big creature effects houses are gone now. They are dead out in Sun Valley. They're all gone. Uh, it's all switched to digital. Now, consequently, I meet Alex, who's a guy that didn't work with models. He didn't work with, with latex. But he sat at his computer and wanted to learn how he could replicate those things on his own with no instruction. And I looked at his stuff, probably it's been seven years now, six years at least that we've known each yeah. other. And yeah. I was blown away. And I said, I'm taking this guy out to dinner. And I took him and his wife to dinner. And I said, your husband's extremely talented. I, I, I want to work with you. You know, so we started working together and we get along really well. But I mean, a below the line doesn't get enough coverage anymore but we're looking at the independent space and that's completely different than working on a movie with a crew of 300 people because we, we can't afford that luxury and you had asked earlier about how it's, this affected us we would be going full steam like a roll like you know steamroller 
in production on Black Veil right now. It was all lined up. Everything was going to go boom, 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 boom. We were all slotted for our time to shoot and everything got blown out of the water. So, I mean, it's been great that we've been able to hang out and we've done some contest things that we're doing on the side and, and we were able to give the young guy to go and shoot all of the stuff for us and, and put the, the weight on his shoulders as sort of a, you know, you buy the drinks because you're the new guy. It's been it's been fun. I feel very honored to meet these guys. I, I'm sort of surprised we have not run across each other, but in our game in town, you're sort of like an apex predator, even though, you know, I'm not talking about you know, like Spielberg, a super apex monster, predator, you know, camera and those kind of things. But we probably have been in offices where we were coming in and the other one's leaving, you know, pitching on some of the same things. And it's not really too social because everybody's competing against each other. So this is sort of neat because we've got all these stories that and anecdotes that are, you know, about things we've experienced and we all have similar, very similar experiences. So we get to try to avoid a lot of these things. And, you know, Dan and Jeffrey both had movies just come out. So, you know, I'm going to leave it to them because I want them to promote their movies. Well, I think Tari touched into it, but the, the, the horror genre in particular, um, sci-fi horror, it, it really so much of it is about community. You know, um, you talk about below the line, and but I have never, you, there is no other genre that has a more devoted fan base, a more devoted community, both those that work on set and those that are the fans than this genre. And, and I, you know, and it's sort of ironic because we're all kind of sort of sickos, if you will, <laughs> for what we put on the screen, but horror people are always the coolest, friendliest people on the planet and the fans are awesome. And that's, always refreshing whenever I go to one of these festivals or I hang out with these guys, it's always just so much fun. And, um, and we're like kids in a candy store. We're getting to make these really cool movies and blow people up and, you know, blood going everywhere and whatnot. But it is, it is, uh, it really is, uh, you know, a, a great community. And that's, it's, um, you know, that's, that's pretty special. Yeah. I think as far as the younger generation, you know, because I just spent a lot of, I think we all do, especially now that we've been quarantined. I, I just spend a lot of, when I have free time, just going through stuff on Netflix and Amazon. And I'm always reading the horror websites to see what people can, you know, put out there. And so I'm just happy when I come across a film that excites me. Like I saw uh, Monster Party, you know, and these aren't, I'm not going to name everyone. And I don't want to offend any filmmakers that I know that I, but you know, I, I, I saw that. I was like, this is really good. I've got to reach out to this, you know, this filmmaker. And I saw The Wretched, which I thought was good. And, you, you know, I just, you know, you just see a lot of films that are, that just kind of, you're, you're not expecting anything because there is a lot of clutter out there. Um, so when you come across something that's well-made and the, the director or writer has a distinct voice, I think that's what's really exciting for, for all of us. And, you know, we're seeing the great thing about the internet. I mean, it's got a bunch of horrible things about it, but the great thing about it is you can get your work out there and people can see it. And so I'm just happy to see like a lot more diversity in stories as well. And just, I think the more voices that we hear from, you know, I tell artists like the, the thing that makes you special is what's going to make your work special. And since we're all human beings, we all have the same fears and the wants and the same needs. So you, if you write a human story, we can all connect to it. It doesn't matter what race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, it doesn't matter who's creating that story, but writing from your perspective will make your story unique. So a lot of times we spend a lot of times in Hollywood, you know, trying to water ourselves down, especially with studios where they are, they want a four quadrant film that's going to appeal to everybody. So then you have to like take out everything that's going to make it special. But in the indie world, you get to tell your story and like let your voice be heard. And I think that that's what excites all of us. You know, when you see, you know, even like a passion, pro like Dan, you know, the Blair Witch was a passion project. They went out and made that shit happen. Uh, I can say shit, it's Fangoria. Um, they made that shit happen. And you, that you, that passion comes across in their work. Um, and that ha that's for, young filmmakers, older filmmakers, any filmmaker, you can tell when somebody had the resources and put their blood, sweat and tears into something. You can just tell, it just comes across on the screen. So that's what's really exciting about seeing all the content out there. Yeah, yeah no, that's, I mean, that's true. And you know, it's funny, like, uh, you know, going back to your, your question, uh, 
you know, since the whole pandemic thing happened and movie theaters started closing down. And so web platforms became a new way to, to showcase your work and tell your stories, which it's always been there and they were mostly reserved for, uh, you know, low budget films. And, but now there's more and more quality content seeping into the web. Like I was, I know you probably guys as well. I was extremely, you know, uh, impressed with uh, Mike Flanagan's uh, The Hunting of uh, Hill House on Netflix. That yeah. series I thought was so well done. And the story was, it had it had very familiar elements, but it, it brought so much more new elements to a horror genre. Um, or what Duffer Brothers created on Netflix was Stranger Things. I yeah. completely fell in love with that series. It's such a quirky, fun, sometimes scary, you know, it takes you takes you in the kind of memory land uh, lane ride with a, with an eighties genre and stuff like that. So there's, there's always uh, a new room to explore, but um, yeah. And, and I think like, as far as the genre in general, what, what, what other genre can scare you while you're in safe environment, make you feel alive. And then you still enjoy popcorn, you know, it's, it's a horror genre. I mean, it's uh, the best, the best sort of a, a thrill, thrill ride you can get without getting injured or hurt you know so so you gotta love horror genre i don't yeah. know anybody who doesn't love horror genre you know or at, at least enjoy it to some point they might enjoy it at some point get too scared and be like i don't like horror but in reality they enjoyed it yeah i think so many of us i mean i grew up in georgia and and i grew up in a small town that i never thought in a million years marvel would move most of their filming to a field in the middle of basically on the edge of outskirts of my town like that, that pinewood which now just got renamed something else today but you know that was never a concept in my brain growing up i never thought you know i watched star wars and saw you know holograms and ewoks and i just i couldn't even comprehend that i just knew that's what i wanted to do so for someone like myself that's from georgia you know you growing up in russia there's so many people regardless of age, genre fans all over the world that want to make these films that are trying to do it, you know, seemingly on their own, where they're on these, you know, little creative islands. What's the advice you can give to people? You know, how, how do they get a life raft? How, how do they connect with people? I know we have obviously the internet, but specifically, what would be the advice um, you would either give like, you know, yourself prior when you guys were first starting in today's world, or sort of what are, you, what are your thoughts for people really just getting themselves out there and, and joining us on the, you know, this crazy adventure? Uh, uh, don't, don't doubt yourself, just do it. No, I, just I don't think there's one way to do any of this stuff. I, I, I think it's, there's a million prescriptions to a million problems. And I think if you were to ask us how each one of us, quote, made it into, the, into Hollywood, it would be, similar in regards and different in regards uh, in certain ways, certain aspects. So, I mean, today, I just can't imagine having the tools that are available today to the average kid. He can shoot high quality content on a phone, edit it on the phone, find music libraries of free music, do sound effects. And, uh, you know, with small investments, if he has a desktop or she has a desktop, to be able to uh, learn final, uh, you know, uh, after, after effects and some of these other, you know, I mean, you used to always hear about Maya and some of these big expensive programs, Oxygen and all that. But now this stuff is just, I, I, I am surprised I'm not seeing more stuff that people are doing with it. There are all these tools available. There is going to be a couple people out there right now that are going to be the next Spielberg and Cameron that are in school that are going to do it all on their phone and just blow everybody's mind. Oh, yeah. Just blow everybody's mind. Yeah. I can't wait for it. People come to me and they're like, Doug, you're a producer. Give me money to make my movie. And I'm like, well, can I see something? Uh, no. Yeah. I'm like, go, go shoot something, go edit it, go put it together. Show me your, cause a lot of it is, you know, I like to recreate, you know, Tommy's stuff, you know, old scary movies and uh, he's gone, but, but you know, I'm not doing anything unique. What Jeffrey said was, show us something unique on how you do it. And so when I watch their shorts, I'm like, if you're not happy, don't show me. Shoot it a hundred times. And then when you finally figure out your craft well enough to show it, I'll watch it. 
And if it's something unique or interesting, it, I'll introduce you to people. I'll, I'll pass it around. And I know these guys are the same. If something stands out, we get excited about that. We're like, hey, we found something cool. So I would say just you grab your camera, grab a camera, grab you know an editing program, and just start shooting stuff for fun. And you'll be able to be your worst critique. Oh, we, we all are. We're artists. So it, make it again and again so you're happy with it. Then start showing it around. It'll be really interesting. You know, people will probably gravitate towards it as you learn your unique voice in storytelling. Oh, yeah. one, of the, one of the worst offenders offenses that you can make is is continually talking about what movie you're going to make it but never make it mm -hmm. and <laughs> that happens all the time so it's like someone walking into the room and telling you they're a singer and then you say well sing something right that's what you expect so show us what you got mm -hmm. and if it's good then you'll get noticed trust me you will get noticed um, and the other little bit of advice I give like starting filmmakers out is it's better to really kick ass at something small than mediocre at something bigger. So keep your expectations in check and put all your energies in making those two minutes really rock rather than telling everyone you shot a feature film and nobody wants to watch it because it's unwatchable. So you know, that's what I wish I could have told my old self or younger self today <laughs> that's a good one that's that, those are actually really excellent points yeah i think the best advice for our younger selves is you know when we were young like i thought the first script i wrote was the best script ever and then i went back and read it years later i'm like oh my god this is horrible so i i think you you have to keep working because because nothing i think all of our stories probably the thing that I had in common is nothing was ever given to us you know everything came from work that we continually did even if it didn't pay off in the way we thought it would. So it's like, keep, keep making content because you're gonna get better as you, as you do more and more. Um, be open to cr constructive criticism, surround yourself with healthy, good creative people, that, that's really important. So no matter where you're at in the country, there are, there are people in your town that love to make films. I, I was speaking at a class once and there were directors and writers there and the, I was with Craig Perry, we were both speaking, the producer in Final Destination and he asked the writers and directors how many of them knew each other and none of them did. And he's like, you guys are like, you guys are, you guys should be friends because you need each other. And I think that that's one thing that a lot of times we don't, when, especially when we were younger, we're like, we're the best at everything and we don't need anybody else. And so I think it's surrounding yourself with talented people and just keep making things because you'll get better and better. And the people will notice if you make something special, it will get noticed. Yeah, I, I think the collective probably thread that we all have as well, those of us who are sort of you know, doing this full time, is that none of us ever gave up. I mean, <laughs> the acquisition of Vangoria itself was, you know, kind of messed with me at mindset all summer, but I knew that it was something that I, I was passionate about and Abby was passionate about and we knew that we could do it together, kind of yin to the yang, like I needed his skill set, you know, he needed someone who knew the entertainment world a little bit better. Um, and, you know, just finding a partner, a collaborator, Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about how finding, you know, I know you guys co-directed. Can you explain a little bit more about what that looks like? So, yes, um, I think I think kind of from the start, again, as Jeffrey just mentioned, uh, Jeffrey, you're, you're hitting all the right, all the right points in my book. Uh, Yes, uh, constantly work at it, you know, practice, practice makes it perfect, uh, right. you know, uh, sharpen your, your skills, your craft. And that's what I've been doing since, uh, since I, you know, since I was 12, you know, with whatever means uh, possible. And then unfortunately, before I moved to United States, I was more in isolation. It was, uh, I don't think the the dreams of becoming uh, filmmaker storytelling are not deeply rooted in, in, in Russia as much as they're in the United States. And, you know, for me, it was also like, oh, the land of opportunity, I can, I can do this. So, plus it was the age, I mean, the, the years when the technology start reaching out the, you know, home desktop computers, you could do a lot more. Consumer cameras were becoming more sophisticated. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the crafting the stories in visual media was becoming a thing for, you know, very achievable. So I started exploring that. I started learning that. So I started creating my own stories, tell it in the best way I could kind of, you know, working on my craft. And eventually, uh, you know, people start noticing. People start noticing. They start passing it around, passing it around. And I was, in Danny's case, I was working. I was, I lived in San Diego. And, um, you know, I was... Uh, 
trying to do as much as it possible as I could uh, visual effects wise editing working on different projects for different people as a freelancer uh, one of my friends reached out and be like hey and he was uh, asked me if I want to shoot a little uh, music video for a friend, a friend of his I said yeah of course I'll, I'll do it more more ways of me for me to practice and as happened uh, that that musician was Danny's good friend from uh, Danny's younger years when he was in the band in San Diego and you know in between the the takes we're taking a break and he started asking questions I was like yeah i'll show you a couple things so i showed him a couple things i've done a couple shorts uh with heavy visual effects and i was like oh my god uh this is amazing i gotta introduce you to my friend and my first impression was like I'm sure i've heard it many times like yeah people sending the links and he's like no no you you're gonna love this guy he's uh he uh wrote underworld movies pick my interest instantly I'm like wait, wait wait the underworld movies it was like yeah so and that's how we got connected you know he forwarded the link and as the guys mentioned it like you know the, create something unique work on your skill it will get noticed somebody will pass it along to somebody you will get connected with uh, you know someone eventually and in our case we did click really well we had, you know, similar interests uh, in history, especially like archaeology. Uh, you know, my uh, European background. I, you know, uh, and and Danny's wife's European background, and it's, you know, we kind of we had a lot of things to talk to at dinners. So we start uh, visiting each other at, you know, We're nerds. Was, yeah, yeah, nerds, nerds, yeah, nerd <laughs> connection, hundred percent. And then one thing after another, we decided to collaborate on a couple things, develop a couple projects. And that, and that goes as usual. You know, you shoot an email, you talk on the phone, and be like, hey, what do you think about this idea? Exchange a couple ideas back and forth, craft the story, move it forward. We shoot a concept, uh, concept kind of proof, concept short films. It goes forward. And I think that's how relationships are formed. They form out of, uh, you know, similar interests, similar passions, and strive to to create something whether you have budget or not you find ways of you know making things happen and then again you create something unique and interesting and gets forwarded and people notice so in our in our sort of uh collaboration and of course dan is uh, danny is amazing writer uh he's a nerd in his heart Mm -hmm. uh and we love the same same thing so whenever we work on the, developing a new story on new elements for already existed story we kind of geek out at it together you know and, and it's it's a brainstorm of nerdness be like hey what if this happens he was like oh yeah just like in this movie see he gets the reference right away mm -hmm. so and then obviously we're not trying to you know, uh, copy other other things. Give it all the way out. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 a it's a great way to communicate where when you operate in the same brainwave, so to speak. You know, so that's that's kind of my experience. And there's working still a guy who does here, which is nice, which is hard to find in Hollywood. Yeah. And well, there we go. <laughs> egos. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a rare it's a rare collaboration. I mean, the, those collaborations yeah. are something to treasure and and. And the problem with Hollywood a lot of times is that you sort of they're like forced marriages. You're having to collaborate with a bunch of executives you've never met that aren't really creative themselves. And their job is to give you notes and whatnot. And, and so you're having to walk this line between pleasing them and not pissing them off and also get your movie made. So, so it's nice, you know, having a, a forum that we're able to make these short films and work with, with really talented people. Um, you know, I don't need to tell them how to make their movie. They, they're, these guys know how to make movies. We just, as long as it's plugged into our overall concept, then, you know, I'm excited to see what comes out. But, but that collaboration is, is, uh, is rare. It's just hard to come by. Yeah. I, I mean, I spend probably half my calls uh, just nerding out with people. Uh, and we're all in it because we care about it and we want to do this as a career and we're passionate about it. I'd love to hear kind of what you guys have going on outside of this, sort of what you guys are looking forward to moving forward. Jeffrey, I know you've been directing um, a fair bit lately and know a few of you have new projects. Do you guys want to tell us about them? Yeah, um, I just directed my first feature, uh, Don't Look Back. It's going to be coming out uh, next Friday. Um, hopefully in some drive-ins, but definitely on video on demand. Uh, it's a supernatural, like thriller horror film. I'm really excited about it. So you we'll can, share uh, that for you. 
Oh, we'll, thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll push that out. Into the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, put it on the digital cover. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. And I, I produced a film called The Call that came out this past weekend with Lynn Shea and Tobin Bell. So I'm really excited about that as well. So those are the two main things I have going on um, right now. And so I'll, I'll let the rest like come out on Twitter like I announce everything important. You know, I'm like the president that way. Anything important, I just put out on Twitter. Hey. <laughs> Uh, for myself, I just finished a movie called Sky Man that uh, came out, uh, I guess it's been a couple of months now. Um, we did a drive-in release over the summer, and it's now out on Amazon and all the usual suspects. So that was what kind of occupied most of my brain for the last year and a half or so. And, and then on top of that, it's been the, 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 black, the black veil stuff. And, and of course, the Quarantine Creep Fest, which is our online horror concept or contests that we're all involved with as well. So that's been keeping me pretty busy. And that's so we can find some really good new talent. Yeah, we're yeah, hoping yeah. that we get stuff that will blow our socks off. Yeah. Doug, do you want to tell us a bit more about how people can get involved with Black Bell and sort of, you know, if you, I mean, not if, but when you guys go back into production, how people can get involved? Well, we actually already prepped for our next show and a half, and no one's supposed to know that, though. So um, we're, we're moving forward as if uh, uh, the world is in a normal place. Uh, nothing scares us. Um, but a couple of things. Um, the Creep Fest I mentioned, there's a Facebook page that Dan put up. If people want to submit their short films, there's a bunch of cash prizes. People are going to win cameras and money. But then I know they're watching it to find new up, up, up and coming directors that we can actually use for other projects. Um, so that's kind of a fun way to find talent. Um, then as far as um, one other thing on a side note, I was talking to a buyer yesterday and he was telling me that because there hasn't been any new content in the past year, they're all running out of content. So if you have that horror film sitting at home, you didn't finish the sound score, or if you, you know, just have something you just want to tweak a little bit, do it. Now is the time to refinish it, put it back out there because the buyer is starting in, in November. Um, there's a virtual AFM, then January, there's another one. They're going to start looking for content they haven't seen before. So if you have stuff, finish it. Now's the time. Um, and if, if it's a really boring movie, turn it into a really exciting short, you know, cut 45 <laughs> minutes. No, like, like Dan said, a really good short will really get people's attention. Um, so for Black Phil, we do, we do two things. One, um, we have family days. When we need lots of uh, extras on set, we just invite people out. And um, we're always really busy. Uh, but the first time um, episode, we were shooting this huge carnival scene, had, had several hundred people out. Throughout the time, we just start talking with people on set. And we actually met some really cool people and like, hey, you know, what are you doing later? You want to, you know, hang out? And so we just kind of brought some people into the next couple scenes and made it more featured in the next couple scenes. And like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? You know, you want to you know, come back to set? You know, and, and so it was really fun just to find some cool people on set. And we just found things for them to do. We just wanted to have them around. So when we announced family days, family just means, you know, if you're cool and you're in the Tampa area, come to set. We'll find something for you to do on camera usually. Um, the other thing we do is we're casting always. Uh, and I want to tell a story about Dan casting our lead, Abby Island. He had auditioned her um, several years ago for, for a film and just um, didn't end up Skyman. casting her. Yeah. yeah, for Skyman. So then now we're looking and looking and we're finding all this talent in the Tampa area for Black Veil. Um, so go to Black Veil online, submit a, um, um, either a monologue that you love, a favorite scene you love, something that's really cool, or pull the sides down and submit. We watch all that stuff. So now as we're casting, Dan just out of the blue goes, Abby Island, she's our lead. I'm like, who, who is that? I've never heard this name. I was, oh, no, I auditioned her two years ago. Trust me. And so she was awesome. So sometimes we will watch all these audition tapes, and it may not be for episode two, but if you're really good and stand out, we will remember that and pull you back for something later. So film yourself, um, submit it at Blackfell Online. Uh, the directions are there, and we're definitely going to watch all that stuff. Yeah, I think what I was most excited about you know, when you emailed us was just this collaborative nature. I was impressed not only that you guys came together, but also because you are sort of reaching out into the creative community. So kudos to you guys. Like that, that's always where my sort of passion is as well. Um, we'll go ahead and get those links tweeted out or sort of get, you know, more pinpointed um, location for you guys to follow and get this information. So I just wanted to thank you guys um, for joining the conversation tonight. If there's anything we can help you guys with or collaborate in the future, we'd obviously love to keep promoting your work with Fangoria. 
Uh, well, so Fangoria. Fangoria. Yeah, thanks for keeping Fangoria. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for keeping it yeah, going. That's, that's great. Yeah, I, yeah. thank it, you. It's the coolest. Great. I there are no like it. It really is like it feels like I got my Nintendo again. Like the Christmas. <laughs> My brother got to Nintendo, which I still considered my Nintendo too. Like that, that's what it feels like every day. So it's just such a blessing and we're just so lucky. And, and it's obviously our passion to keep it alive. Well, congrats still, on doing that. Yeah, it's still a quarterly print. Print. I'm a purist, so it'll always be in print. Uh, and then always practical effects for me. I'm just like a practical effects junkie. Um, nice. But if you guys don't mind, I just have like a little message from from Avi and I, for everyone. We just wanted to thank you for the warm welcome through the acquisition period. We know we're the new owners. <laughs> we know there's growing pains or little hiccups or that you guys may not know us, but we're just so appreciative. And just thank you guys um, from the bottom of our hearts. And also our team is amazing. They are the blood. You know, our entire, entire team is Fangoria. So Fangoria lives. Um, we're gonna do these panels every Wednesday until the end of the year. So if you guys have ideas for panels or if you guys want to get back on a panel or if you guys see a creator that even you guys know that you think we should talk to or have a conversation with, please, please let us know. Um, but I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you for joining us. And I'll talk to everyone soon. All right. Thank thanks you for having Thank you. 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 Thank you.